morning, getting on to seven o'clock. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have this uh, much awaited lecture on uh, tank warfare by uh, Anand. Most of you know Anand. I mean, uh, you know, apart from what I've given in the uh, his CV, which is given on the invite, you can, uh, his enthusiasm for military history is such, you know, unlike, you know, most of you must have. Uh, Join Colors of Glory by either by taking a, I mean, while coming to a meet of ours or through a website or whatever. In Anand's case, he is not happy with that. He just he, he fixed up an appointment, came to my house. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you and I wanted to be a member. I said, fine. So there you are. And he also sort of uh, hosted a, a, a meeting for us one day at his house to, for us to see his museum. Uh, he was there during our. Uh, exhibition the first time explaining the thanks to everyone. In fact, he only arranged that uh, gentleman, uh, his, his friend of his Colonel Pineraj. family, friend of his uh, former EME officer who is making tank models. So you, you might remember in our exhibition, all that, uh, uh, what do you call, automated models and all he brought. Uh, uh, Pineraj should be there, right? Send him the invite, he asked him to join. So there we are, Anand. Um, uh, all yours, you can start. Okay. Thank you so much, Captain, sir. Uh, it's really been a pleasure and honor to be given this opportunity. So, uh, but let me try my best to uh, share what I know and I hope uh, at the end of it, there is some learning out of it. So in this session, we're going to focus on the evolution of uh, tank warfare. In essence, we would start initially with trying to understand what was the need of a tank kind of when did it originate uh, uh, and it could be going back to even the ancient times and then the medieval times a little bit about that and see how they fared or what kind of tanks were used in world war one some of the key battles and in world war two some of the famous battles their tanks did feature and have a role to play with respective countries and then most important the india context what were the tanks that we used across in our battles you know with pakistan and china in the battles that we have fought across and then closing off for the last great tank battle in 1991, which you probably would otherwise associate it with the Gulf War. Uh, and then some interesting photos at the end as well. Uh, so uh, my humble request is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, this is a long uh, presentation slides here. So we'll first try to finish and go through the presentations in order not to miss any topic or slides. And then we will try to have any question or, uh, and I'm most looking forward for uh, wonderful feedback from you all, from uh, you know experienced veterans uh, like you. So I've kind of split the topic likewise, as you see in the slide now. Uh, and then uh, we would start with the first topic and to understand what is the need of a battle tank. So until the 20th century, tanks have not been actually been used as a concept. But if you look at the ancient warfare, the ancient ancestor of the modern battle tank is actually a chariot. It kind of encompasses those characteristics which we will try to look at in the further slides. And then further on in the middle century, it comes up as a used when the gunpowder and the guns were invented. So there were some battles where there was a kind of a tank that was invented, but it is actually not a battle tank yet to be called. But when you look at the First World War, the key element was until then, there was heavy dependency on cavalry as in ancient battles. So traditionally you had the infantry forming up in block or checker blocks and you had cavalry on either side to support the flank and at the back. And then that's how tanks were also kind of used or envisaged as how tanks can be used. Preliminarily, preliminarily to say tanks were kind of infantry support vehicles to say. And World War I looked at a lot of trench uh, warfare happening. And then uh, we will see a couple of pictures or say photographs after this to explain for those who haven't seen what World War I battlefield looks like. So in order to overcome that, the concept of tank slowly evolved into what we have or what we know into the modern uh, battle tank. Heavy casualties were there in World War I. Objectives were not being met. That's a little bit about World War I before the actual modern concept of a tank came in. Now, if you look at the pre-medieval and the pre-World War I era, you had a Czechoslovakian general, uh, Jan Zeska, who was quite known popular to fight. And you know, the Battle of Grunewald, say in 1410 or so, when he was trying to fight uh, with some of the uh, uh, Teutonic uh, orders at that time, there was a kind of a wagon that he used 
with holes and all with guns and uh, cannons pointing around so it gave a resemblance of a concept of what he was thinking that eventually we would know that came involved as a tank and then we know that leonardo da vinci was an engineer an architect a painter and all of that so one of his infections inventions that he did was a kind of a uh, an armored vehicle which was manually cranked to be mobile as you see in the first picture there conical shape thinking that this concept the conical shape would help deflect any missile weapon that is being fired upon and then you would have four hefty people doing the manual crank inside which would make it uh, do mobile so in a way if you imagine you're talking about armor here you're talking about firepower from inside you're talking about some kind of a mobility here so in 1903 that further evolved into a french captain from the 6th artillery battalion so uh, in france and then he came up with a project which which is called the levasseur project so he designed a kind of a tracked vehicle so it was looked at saying that so tracked vehicles came into being later on looking at the uneven battlefields of europe especially experienced just around the first world war time and before that so they wanted something that is mobile enough a little sturdy invert that can navigate over very uneven soggy battlefields so in agriculture if tractors were a kind of an invention and tracked caterpillar tracks were there so they kind of tried to use that concept to see whether i can load a citadel on top of that into a tracked caterpillar track and then fix a weapon or so in that and then maybe that kind of uh, evolved into what he thought was a self propelled cannon uh, project that came about what would eventually happen is the government would not uh, pick up this project this uh, you know blueprint of it he would the government would come up with a few defects around it and then reject it but the end of it when world war 1 actually comes up the french design something using almost with a collaboration with the snider company of france and other companies which kind of looks like almost what it looks like what the french captain leon uh, tried to develop he would be very disappointed of course at the end of it but he retired with that and when we move on now just before the world war 1 began the austrian engineering officer he came up with something that kind of resembles of a fighting vehicle with a rotating turret now rotating turret wasn't heard of until then so this is something that he came up which which means you don't have to turn the whole tank around or the whole vehicle around you still aren't calling it a tank so you should remember that so the whole vehicle doesn't need to turn around so this is something very innovative that that he came up with and uh, that wasn't taken much further beyond that but an australian civil engineer lance dimoli came up with a proper tracked vehicle that he suggested to the royal commission that this they use and think about by trying to come up with some vehicle that looks like a tank the diagram that you see is that of uh, demole and then uh, being an australian uh, uh, citizen then you probably this vehicle is kind of displayed at the i think the new south wales museum in australia uh, it's still there uh, for public uh, view there so eventually after that what happens is around 1915 it is realized that there should be a thought around this kind of a weapon and warfare and the landship committee is formed so just looking back at it there isn't such a mechanized warfare yet evolving still cavalry based infantry but the navy was there so the idea this time for a tank or a concept for a tank comes from the navy so since navy uh, naval guns were already in operational that's why they kind of called this concept of this committee as a land ship because ships are the guns and you're trying to use it on a land so kind of a land ship for committee was formed with winston churchill on that and then uh, that's where the first evolution of a real concept of a tank was thought about now when so when they were trying to discuss this with all the documentation and paperwork they try now actually to call it a weapon that they are trying to come up with uh, so the war committee or the war council as it yet uh, comes to know this officially because it would then eventually know december onwards and then it would change the name of the committee as i mentioned there so around this time they kind of call it a tank better they want to try to associate it for the discussions to kind of hint it or kind of uh, uh, take it to show that they're talking about a water tank 
So that's actually when the first word tank comes up. When they are trying to hint in their discussions, it's a kind of a water tank project because you know all of this rearmament, armament programs are not happening in the public view. The discussions are happening behind the door when it until it actually officially comes up. So eventually, the word water is dropped. and the word tank stays on for discussions and that is how the word tank is what we know now as this amazing fighting machine that comes into existence eventually now world war 1 begins and then uh, the picture that i have here it's not very clear i know because this is a picture from uh, 1917 the battle of cambrai so i put this up because that's the greatest tank battle that was uh, held the first uh, major charge of uh, tanks that happened in world war so you see all the british tanks charging here so in world war 1 as i was trying to mention before the typical european battlefield miles to miles it looked like this a lot of barbed wire fencing and defense and then uh, you know a lot of artillery shelling happening on either side in france and then uh, the you know It, the field actually becomes full of craters because of the shelling and then you have all the uh, soggy mud because of the climate it looks with a lot of uh, crater holes sogginess uneven mud and all of this and then because of the trench warfare everybody is entrenched the moment you pop up you have a machine gun being fired or shelling happening and then it actually reaches a kind of a stalemate with heavy casualties so if you look at the battle of somme that's where the heaviest casualties happen one of the bloodiest battle that takes place with very heavy casualties so this is where when the so called the tank supply committee comes up with an idea of an actual concept of a battle tank that they very badly need this to overcome the german resistance and go over cross over these obstacles and then capture the territory there are two gentlemen who come up around the time and then uh, they go back to the committee to say that uh, they have come up with a kind of a track vehicle that almost resembles that can be used if you fit a gun to it one was sir william triton he comes up with a vehicle that is called little willy you have the diagram here at the right side bottom this still this can be seen at the museum in uh, england i think it's at the bowing tank museum there this is the first prototype completely preserved and intact of a kind of an idea of a concept what it thinks that a 2 pounder 20 uh, mm gun can be fixed to into it or a machine gun and can be used but there's also a major walter gordon who comes up with a rhomboidal shape the diagram is right about that on the left top and then he kinds of calls it with a very funny name of his majesty's land ship centipede you at december before the name changes you are still stuck with that old name of this land ship uh, you know with the background that i explained and then this eventually becomes a british mark 1 tank that goes into first world war as a first tank that enters into battle and that is why it is kind of christened as the mother now this is some of the uh, tanks that i have uh, i thought it's useful to show this before we go on to some of the famous battles in first world war so this is a mark 4 battle the previous screen was a mark 1 battle so this mark 4 bat uh, uh, battle tank is something that features with uh, improved versions over the mark 1 in the battle of cambrai now i've written male plus female so that must be quite surprising for you all to understand what this actually means well now by the definition when they had these tanks design initially they had the machine guns then they said let's put on a 57 mm cannon to it and then when the designs were coming up between the mark 1 and the mark 4 as i said they borrowed the guns from the navy the guns were quite large and huge so at during trials or when it was used initially at the battle of somme it was kind of one even when he was going over the ditches and all the guns were so used they used to actually get stuck in the mud and you know, hit obstacles the length of the gun or the barrel itself used to become quite unwieldy so they cut short the barrel and then they came up with this model now they have a gun here a cannon of 57 and then they have a machine gun here usually a 7.62 mm gun or sorts and then they kind of gave it names so initial models had the gun and the cannon eventually they took off did two separate models out of it the tanks that had the cannons were called the male tanks and the ones that only had the machine guns were called the female tanks that's how they distinguished the two different tanks for the british in the mark 4 onwards after the first model the second prototype and the production model onwards that get went into the battle now the french ft17 is something that is remarkable for its design because it more or less resembles of what a tank 
around the end of first world war and into second world war would look like it was among the maximum produced tank that the french had actually the french produced more number of tanks than all the allied powers in world war 1 put together and then this has a rotating turret so that's the first innovation that they come about which you do not see in the british tank or even the rival on the right which is the german tank so this tank a french ft17 has its own uh, action in world war 1 but most important because of its innumerable numbers being manufactured a lot of countries take attention note of this they are, are picked up by russia and then other countries americans get their share of it and then canadians and the china and japan also has so if you look at late towards a, a clo in you know, a beginning of uh, the second world war and then you look at it some of the models of the light tanks which these countries come up with initially when they actually do not go into heavier tanks would look little similar with some features copied adopted from this french tank and modified with their own innovations and technologies and uh, yeah so the german came up came up with this heavy uh, machinery looking at uh, uh, the need very bad need for a battle tank and then this is the sturm panzer wagon a7v this was the first tank that the germans produced but a little late in the war they never realized the importance of the tanks uh, until they got hit by the british mark 4 now a quick comparison of the tanks that we just looked at so i picked up only the key tanks that we kind of spoke of and then to just to highlight the kind of the weight because you would immediately ask one looks small one looks big so it's a quick comparison so the french looks very light infantry support vehicles the mark 4 is pretty heavy with 32 tons and the panzer wagon for the germans is pretty heavy is huge tanks accommodating eight people for the french and then 18 people here so i've kind of indicated if you look at the armament saying for the mark 4 tank if it was a male it had the cannons so you had four people at least to operate one as a loader one as a gunner and so you had four people there and four people to drive two people in the front two people to change the gears at the back uh, in that rhomboidal shape machine that you saw and eight in people in the panzer wagon because you have six machine guns you got somebody to feed the belt in the machine gun and then the gunner there so that becomes 12 people automatically and then you have a cannon uh, uh, operator a gunner and a loader there that automatically becomes 14 and then you have people to drive the tank as well and uh, uh, and the numbers that you see as i said the french had the maximum numbers belt and the germans still haven't even evolved much into world war 1 a very basic number of 20 tanks being produced which actually becomes obsolete and they discard this project at the end of the first full war uh, until we talk about interwar uh, tanks that are being further developed now if you look at world war 1 but before that a quick uh, note it was by no means a very comfortable machine either for the panzer wagon or for the mark 4 horrible living conditions fighting conditions inside by the crew i'll probably kind of refer to that talk about that towards the end of the presentation uh, so these are some of the key battles that i picked uh, from uh, world war 1 the battle of somme kind of started in july ended in november but it was around 15 september that the mark 1 saw the first action there about 41 or 49 of them were planned to be deployed but eventually around 28 to 32 go into action and then this is a scene where the germans haven't even seen a tank coming at them they are in their trenches and they look at a sudden huge machine rumbling towards them at a low speed in all the fog of war there and then it's firing its cannons they have absolutely no idea what it is what are they supposed to do because they remember they don't have a weapon to meet a tank in battle they don't even have the tank at that point of time so they use all of their uh, weapons uh, the rifles the machine gun the maxim machine guns grenades even flame throwers kicking to action they do all of that they vacate the initial defense position they keep moving on there but what unfortunately happens is it's a joy for the british infantry of course they come closely followed behind uh, uh, these uh, uh, the uh, mark 1 tanks there but a lot of those tanks break down after initial action they do help cross the trenches and the ditches and they clear through the barbed wire fences these were the fundamental objectives to meet for the tank so they do do that in the initial stages but they are bogged down and then they break down so it becomes a reliability issue here and the germans are also continuously firing at them but initially around 9 managed to reach the no man's land and then the fight goes on and then infantry they all of them uh, envelop and then eventually at the end of it there's a first tank in action it's kind of indecisive 
the war of course the somme war goes until november as i said heavy casualties happen but this is the entry and the battle ends there for the first entry of the tank which is a mark 1 the second one the battle of cambrai in 2017 this is where the british come up with an idea colonel fuller there comes up saying we should have an entire armored column charge at the enemy so this is actually a fantastic concept but unfortunately british do not hold this and french also do not do, learn these lessons which you will see in world war 2 eventually so around 378 combat machines and the rest supporting uh, machines of the mark 4 now uh, charge into battle at cambrai and then they again kind of have good success initially on the first day of this and then uh, on the second day onwards again machines start breaking down and then there is a lot of heavy firing going on at this tanks from germany because they have already seen what a tank looks like in the battle of somme so they are kind of prepared they they can kind of uh, use conventional artillery and then uh, you know the heavy uh, infantry weapons to fire at this tanks about 179 are destroyed over there and then uh, what also actually happens is uh, just a note uh, the battle of somme and the battle of cambrai this is also an entry point of a first time that something happens in the war the first of the apcs armored personal carriers are introduced by a british in the war again a cutaway machines of the mark 1 tanks it is also an entry of a kind of self propelled you know guns so howitzers are fitted a 127 mm or so caliber howitzers are fit into this uh, again cutaway designs of the mark 1 uh, tank that you see so these are two other entries that actually make uh, entry into the first world war for the first time in mechanized warfare uh, by the british so in the battle of cambrai also is kind of celebrated in britain but overall the war again ends is quite indecisive so but this becomes a kind of a big event for them in uh, mechanized warfare the first ever charge happens and they are quite successful in this but the victory is kind of indecisive and then the war just carries on as we know until 1918 there's an important note i mentioned about lance zafar gobind singh here he was not a tank gunner or a tank commander here but what we need to understand is because he was part of the gardener's horse which was kind of entrenched there during this battle they were surrounded now they had to get the message out to the regimental headquarters which was kind of 2 uh, kil- miles away or so so there were two indians that they chose uh, to carry this message so one of them was uh, govind singh so the first time we took a horse and he went on there was machine gun fire from the germans and then the horse was killed he falls down he kind of acts dead for some time to fool the germans and he gets up crawls into the headquarters and delivers the message now he has to come back with a return message to tell uh, his commanding unit what the headquarters thinks about it so he again is given a new horse and he comes back he is again shot by the germans for the machine gun fire he again falls but he has uh, he is injured quite a bit there but he managed to crawl back and then delivers the message back here the other messenger that actually goes out is killed instantly so it is only the father govind singh who kind of manages to deliver the message back and forth now they need further help another message has to go out this is where he kind of proves his courage and bravery the britishers actually do not allow him to go but he kind of insists that he knows the route he knows the path he can still carry the message so a third horse is given to him and he goes out galloping on that this time the artillery shelling also begins by the germans one of the shells f- falls and explodes behind the horse the horse is cut into two he goes flying from this horse and he falls he is badly injured he still manages to crawl up to headquarters and delivers a message and the british headquarters is kind of uh, amazed by the amount of courage that he has shown in the face of the battle and this time they tell him not to go and they and eventually uh, he is rewarded for this bravery as a, with the victoria cross and of course after the war he lives up to 1942 so that's a little bit about him which is important for us to know what role he played in the war though he was not associated with the armored divisions The third one is a very important battle, which is about the Villers Bretonnex. That's a small town or a village, and this is where the first tank-to-tank encounter takes place in World War One or the history of warfare. So the Germans kind of capture this town after a heavy shelling, artillery shelling, and 15 A7Vs come and occupy that. But the next day they come out because they know there are some British tanks around. 
so one male and two female british tanks are there supported by so whippets so whippets are another light tanks by the british infantry vehicles they are not supposed to be facing tanks but they still go into support for these uh, mark 4 tanks that go out so in the fog and all the disturbance that has the britishers and the germans they suddenly see a tank coming opposite them they have never encountered this before and this is the first time a tank is encountering a tank there so the british tank fires a few shots it misses and then the germans readjust they wait for the tank to come up they take him and they fire they miss initially but they get a shot but the, there is heavy firing also happening at the other two female tanks coming up and then because of the shelling and firing there is external armor flaking that happens to the female tanks of the british and then for fear of machine gun bullets coming in those two female tanks retreat so it is only one to one tank that takes place eventually and the british again <coughs> kind of readjust their position take aim and fire at the german a7v tank and hits them it's around the same time that this tank also goes into a ditch and it's kind of damaged and all of the crew members bail out and they escape and then of course the british tanks also kind of uh, retreat because they don't want to take the risk of going when they do not know how many more enemy tanks they are going to encounter so that kind of ends the tank to tank encounter in the history of warfare for the first time eventually the village is captured the next day because of reinforcements from the australian brigades and then the, the battle moves on now that we with that we come to end of world war 1 now the i now now we'll go into the world war 2 now so world war 2 kind of completely revolutionized tank for here where warfare the kind of design the concept and how they're going to use it in battle now interwar period we all know history uh, uh, that you know the weimar republic was there and then uh, eventually because of first first world war you know the treaty of versailles was signed and then germany was highly restricted in terms of the rearmament that they couldn't do but secretly rearmament programs were developed that is where one of the concepts that the germans came out of use of uh, armored warfare that eventually evolved the picture that you see here on your screen which i put in as a background is a representative and a kind of a very good painting that i found which is to talk about the 1943 the battle of kursk which is among the biggest tank uh, battles that took place in the history of warfare now it's important to know at this point of time what are the three successful criteria for a successful tank design so it's five power armor and mobility so it's the key balance of this three that's very important to know how you come up with a successful tank design so five power is a caliber and the gun that you use and the armor is a protection that you need so you had armor from 14 mm stick to going up to 180 200 mm and so on towards the end of the war and the cold war picks it up from there and takes it further mobility so in mechanized warfare you need to be highly mobile so the concept is once you break through the enemy's defenses the tanks are supposed to envelop the enemy you got to capture and then finish off the enemy either they surrender or you if the battle still goes on you will have to support to kill them so if you do not have mobile mobility in the tanks they are going to be bogged down you are not going to capitalize on the breach that you make into the enemy defenses that's why these three are very key important and these evolve with playing around with one of this eventually so they come up eventually from a light infantry tank design in world war 2 eventually go to a heavy tank uh, design that we will talk about in the next slides and then if you look at the modern tanks it still sticks to the three fundamental concepts of this fire para armor and mobility you only have so a successful tank design also rests upon a design that you make which is flexible or allows you to enhance and upgrade without entirely scrapping that machine and going in for a new one so it's kind of an investment cost management that you do plus you add on to all these three factors because you bear in mind what the enemy is going to come up with and you pre plan and then you develop the next tank design so these three are very key important items and you would see some of the germans and the british and the americans revolving around these three coming up with new tank designs as we proceed into the war there now it's also important to know i have kind of classified tanks into light tanks medium and heavy tanks here these are very important because as world war 2 started the germans and the americans whether m3 m5 stuart little which of course they call it the name stuart honey as well indians have used that in one of the first battles uh, in 1948 the stuart uh, light tank and then uh, 
other tanks are there, the Panzer I from the Germans, and then uh, other light tanks from the British and the uh, Russians as well. So the essence is they are infantry. There's still the concept is around revolving around infantry support vehicles, and they are supposed to go along with the infantry, support them. You make a breakthrough, support them to get the uh, uh, area captured and then envelop. And then as the war progresses, what is important to note, you see all of the rival countries in the war, they heavily depend upon uh, after action battlefield reports. So you encounter a tank, you know, you come to know that you probably are undergunned or under armored because you, your strategy isn't really going to work. Report comes back to the headquarters. In Germany, you have the Panzer Commission and then so on and so forth in Britain and in Russia as well. People like Stalin, Hitler, all of them take a look at the reports and then immediately there is a development of a next upgrade that happens or an entirely different tanks. So in a sense, the kind of weight of the tanks is kind of determined, say under 20 tons or so, you might tend to call it as a light tank, under 35 tons as a medium tank, like the M4 Sherman with a long barrel 76 millimeter gun, uh, which is called a Sherman Firefly. And then the heavy tanks, about 55 tons or so, there are tanks above that as well. So classification is around this. So again, it goes back to the three key concepts, how you use these factors, how design you do, and the purpose that you meet. So the tanks that you use initially in the war, World War I, the Germans or other tanks, if you encounter a tank that is of a medium or a heavy, and you think that the purpose of the light tank is no longer served, you move that away from your strategy for the next battle, and then you start using the tanks for say recons, or you use the chassis for uh, say a self-propelled or an assault gun or an anti-aircraft gun to be mounted on a satellite user. That's how uh, the evolution of tanks takes place throughout Second World War from left to right from the screen. Super heavy tanks are there, but we are not getting into that because that immediately goes into the Cold War era. So a quick comparison of the World War II tanks here. So I've kind of looked at Panzer I, Panzer III, and Panzer IV. The first four, five columns from the left to right in blue are the German evolution. So if you see how they have evolved in the three categories of armor. So protection has drastically increased. Also reason of how they looked at the first T-34 tanks, the highlighted ones in green from Russia, when they get into Russia, they are shocked to see that machine. They never imagined that they would have a, such a superior tank there. They kind of undermined and uh, kind of underestimated the tank designs of the Russians. Using the copy of that, they kind of involved into a tank which became the Panther. Sloped armor came into the concepts of Germans. So if you look at Panzer 1, 3, and even 4, they are not effectively sloped. And then even the Tiger, the Panzer 6A, which is one of the deadliest weapon they come up with and struck, it became a fear factor and a phobia into the allies. Even that's not effectively sloped because of tank type of the Tiger actually evolved in 1942 and the Panther took copy notes of the T-34 and other tanks and had a slope armor that evolved after the Tiger in 1943. We'll talk a little bit about that when we go into other battles. So if you look at armor, you can look at the evolution. If you look at the armament, it's drastically increased from a puny machine gun on a Panzer one to an 88 millimeter L-71 of a King Tiger, and that becomes the heaviest tank to ever see action on the Second World War battlefield by the Germans. And other tanks are also upgraded from a T-34-76 to an 85 millimeter high caliber gun to take on the enemy. KV-1 is an old model, but a very heavy tank that sees action in Russia. That also kind of startles the enemy. The Shermans are also upgradable, so that's a good future looking design. So from a short barrel 76 millimeter they evolved into a, a firefly for a long barrel gun. So in terms of tank design, the difference between a short and a, a long barrel is longer the barrel, the caliber can be the same. The high muzzle velocity, terminal, uh, the starting velocity of the projectile, the better chances it is that you can penetrate armor for your, uh, you know, at a, at a certain distance. So that's the essential difference between a short and a long barrel, though you might re retain the caliber. It also depends on what kind of uh, uh, sh shell cartridge, the size of the shell that might go in. That's all part of the design. So heavier, the bigger it is, that means it has got more starting velocity, more power to it as it goes on. Like these tanks fire, the heavy tanks fire at around 3000 feet per second. That's the kind of a terrific speed at which it comes and hits at a distance of two kilometers range and completely destroys allies armor. Churchill from the British is a very effective tank, very strong uh, weapon systems, defense there. 
and then it's used in one of the battles but the strategy falters there and the, it's actually not successful in that particular battle which i would talk about a little later char b1 base that's a very good tank from the french but the tra they actually do not use this tank effectively in the uh, german invasion of france and i'll tell you how that happens so kind of a quick comparison that you see and then i'll move on from here these are some of the quick pictures i thought it useful because i've been talking about tanks so those who probably haven't taken a look at it can probably have a look at what it is so the one the one on the left top is a tiger one the picture is a kind of representation of one of the best tank commanders in world war 2 michael wickman with the 85 the upgraded version and the panther tank here so if you look at the slope armor is a kind of a exact copy of it how the germans came up with the design to deflect uh, enemy shells from hitting and then penetrating it and then on the right uh, tie side top you've got a sherman firefly there that's again an upgraded version from a short barrel and the british came up with that version actually uh, uh, to be effectively countering the germans when they actually are in the normandy battles and so on churchill is a tank which i spoke about solid armor round uh, good mobility a little slow about that but well armored to manage the french tank uh, uh, char 1b bis and kind of very effective against uh, german army now talking about armored warfare is a lot of development that takes place so the concept of lightning war comes up initially in 1939 and 40 because after 1940 41 the concept actually dissolves into different strategies so what we otherwise term as uh, blitzkrieg is a kind of happening more than the zoom meeting no it will be only done by phone or anyway it's it's it doesn't affect the presentation so okay. go, go ahead okay and, okay uh, all right so here it's in three simple steps i've kind of uh, try to illustrate from the uh, uh, diagram here step 1 is actually where you know you kind of mobilize the forces of your ar armored columns your artillery and your air force and there's a coalition of the three that's F that's going to be taking care so before you actually arrive at where to attack you actually have a lot of planning to do reconnoitering and all of that to look at the defenses and what the enemy might be having there as defensive and then what you're going to use as an offensive force against it the germans called it schwerpunkt that's a point of focus or a point of uh, area where they would have maximum effect so you would have shelling and uh, aircrafts coming in and then bombing the defenses around there then you would have the, the strength bulk of the armored forces going in there with all the firepower and then penetrating the defenses and the next step is because of uh, it's being it's a mechanized mobile warfare it is expected that these armored columns closely followed by mechanized infantry in columns and then by other supporting units quickly envelop and surround the enemy and then capture that position and then they move forward stabilize that and then go ahead to the next so initial battles of this kind of a lightning war is fought in 1940 when they go up with denmark and uh, uh, holland and then in france uh, and then in france especially the strategy awfully goes wrong with the french they have more number of tanks and then better tanks actually and the germans actually are kind of uh, outnumbered and undergunned with the panzer 1 2s and very limited panzer 3s and 4s uh, and then panzer 4s are still being used as infantry support vehicle here so the french actually have the char 1b tank and all but what goes wrong is they do not concentrate their armor in one place to counter the german armor they distribute their armor across the front so this prevents them from effectively hitting and coming out as a defensive against the enemy tanks here and also very strong communication a technology by the germans tank to tank and a tank commander to the units and all this radio communication is kind of proving to be very effective by the germans advance in technology of that and also proper coordination and mobility of the units here there is an there are a couple of battles here in france overall if you see before france and paris is eventually captured uh, the battle of hanout so here they encounter heavy tank units coming in but again it falters because of lack of strategy lack of vision and the use of tanks here there is a particular town here which is called stone s t o n n e so there is a so this is very important and interesting here where the german defense is set up by about 11 to 13 tanks panzer 1 2 and 3 is here and the weight in this town in the street corner to encounter a french char 1b 
turning around the corner. So as soon as it turns up, all of the German tanks open fire at will. But they are surprised and shocked to see the shells and uh, ammo simply bouncing off this armor. And this is where the Shah 1B proves absolutely deadly. One by one, it knocks out all of the German tanks here. But of course, eventually it knocks all of it out. But it's not able to hold on to that because, again, this is where they use uh, the German Air Force and artillery zeroes in on this town. And eventually the Germans hold back and then the French are not able to capitalize on this initial action there. Now, moving on, a lot of key battles take place in World War II here. First, the Operation Barbarossa, which is in 1941, in June, uh, with the invasion of Russia. So, a 2,000 mile front is opened up by the Germans on June 22nd uh, or so. And then, as usual, it starts with artillery barrage and then rockets with the uh, Nebel buffers and all of that uh, pounding on the uh, defenses. Russians are absolutely not aware, they are not prepared for this because historically, the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact is signed, and Stalin still thinks that Hitler is not going to attack them. And that it is only a certain later point of time when uh, reports go up to him that. German armored columns have advanced into Russia that he realizes this. Here again, it's the usual German concept of concentrated armor, enveloping the enemy, and then uh, kind of completely demobilizing them, capturing them, and going beyond that. And they have huge encirclements happening in the initial stages. Then, of course, uh, during 1942 and 43, it gets on the halt of the uh, Germans are done at uh, Moscow. And then, of course, we know the Stalingrad debacle that eventually takes place. But initially, it's a lot of success here. Germans also have heavy losses taking place here. There is a kind of a battle that takes place in a place called Brody. So this is somewhere close to the Russian border when initially Barbarossa takes place. So as soon as it, they encounter heavy resistance from Russian tanks here. And then Germans take heavy losses here. Again, it is very poor coordination by the Russians to mobilize all of their armor, communication, and then flanking movements. So the German strategy here, if you observe from France and now in Russia and so on is, if you encounter a stronger armor, three, four German tanks attack the enemy tank at once, and then they kind of achieve what you might call as a mobility kill. So they disable the tank, but it's not fully finished yet because its main armament turret is still active and it can still fire its gun. So this is when they have a tank with a stronger bar, uh, caliber gun like the Panzer IV with a 75 millimeter. They enable and give time for such tanks to outflank, get to the side or the rear, and then punch a hole into the armor of the enemy. This is how I achieve the most of the wins, apart from their artillery and the famous German 88 guns, they come in and zero in. So the German 88 is basically an anti-aircraft weapon, which assumes a lot of importance throughout World War II and effectively used in France by Rommel. And then it goes on to North Africa into those battles against uh, the British armor there and causes a lot of havoc there against the US armor as well in North Africa. And throughout until the Normandy battles over the end of the war, there are upgraded workers. So a gun which is supposed to fire at an aircraft 30,000 feet into the air is firing at tanks at 1,000 yards, 2,000 yards, and so on. Devastating effect. And there are very good <coughs> reports of allied tank commanders actually kind of awed at the, at the usage of this. And then they are surprised that such a weapon is being put to use. So it's again the design. So the design makes this gun to be flexible, to be used at a horizontal trajectory using armor piercing <coughs> cells as well. So the next part, we move on to the DF raid. So 1942, the British and the Allies kind of uh, emphasized that they needed to capture this port, which is at the north of France, uh, uh, the DF area. And it's for intelligence gathering and uh, certain activities that they want to do and hold that port there effectively for some time and cause a lot of uh, damage to the Germans there. And they plan this amphibious. This, this is one of the initial amphibious uh, attacks that takes place from the Allies' perspective. That's why it's important to mention that. Also, the Churchill tanks is seen for the first time in action there. It's kind of a newly developed weapon there. And then what goes wrong here is is effective planning on how to get the tanks off the beaches. So it kind of landing crafts are there. Tanks are kind of offloaded. They are, all of them are not able to get off the beach here. Some of the assault engineers are killed in action. Some of them are not able to mobilize themselves. There is only a kind of a static 
a german division they are defending it not a very strong armored force or but still the strategy and the planning goes wrong here the tank all of them are not able to get off the beach and then uh, eventually uh, the operation as such fails but what is important for the allies is they pick up these learnings from the dia parade which is a failure and all of these learnings go into strong effect when they go on to plan for the normandy evasion uh, operation overlord in 1944 june that's a key message here the germans kind of inspect the tank they think it is of the old technology they are not very happy with the technology but it's actually not the fault of the tank people tend to read this invasion and say the churchills were a failure the churchills were not a failure it's how you did not use them effectively is where it failed not a single arm piercing shell had got into the churchill and damaged them so that's the key that the tank was good but the strategy failed you didn't use it effectively enough to gain what you wanted the battle of course this is a separate chapter in the next slide we'll deal with that uh, in uh, the next slide the normandy battles here again so basically normandy battle normandy as such the country is a bocage country full of hedgerows which means you've got narrow roads there and you've got kind of fields there with 3 to 4 feet of hard bund and then thick undergrowth and shrubs and trees growing on so it's kind of a checker block there with the kind of fields with narrow roads with all the trees and all so it's a perfect defensive natural trade terrain that the germans have now first of all rommel's idea was to have his panzer divisions move up to the coast when the normandy invasion takes place this doesn't happen because of various uh, debates arguments and hitler says that he wants to be the ones deciding where to position the armor and eventually because of his own problems people do not wake him up and then he usually tends to sleep at 3 am or so and then his generals alfred jordan led of operations all of them failed to inform him on time so the armor actually is not on the beach front to encounter uh, the landings there that's a kind of a strategy failure apart from an operation that also takes place before the landings which of course makes the germans fool you know fool the germans that the landing is actually going to take place at paddy calais uh, which they think is the closest to the english channel and the coast and the phony army that is developed on, across in england uh, which the germans uh, think that that is actually a kind of an army that is going to invade with cross radio communications and messages being conveying the wrong messages so all of these factors also have to be considered why the germans actually keep concluding that the invasion doesn't take place so the armor never comes up there and then the invasion goes ahead the beach head is established and the allies move in here now the plan is to get on to paris the first city major city is caen and then they want to beat all the german defenses or go but it again fails because of the defensive position that the country offers so strong panzer units with the heavy tiger tanks king tigers come into action so the heaviest tank in the battlefield in world war 2 t sees action from july onwards in this normandy battle they have got a lot of effective tank destroyers the tank destroyers are something is a completely different chapter so they are kind of a cousins of the tank design is separate but end up doing the same role and they are absolutely effective for germany in stopping allied armor at various points to lead to a tactical win but not a kind of an overall uh, win for the war as such and uh, eventually ka kind of is captured but of course here one uh, uh, german tankman michael whitman kind of becomes a legend highly respected by the allied tank commanders because with this one tiger and two other tiger tanks he takes off uh, to a uh, village called villers bocage and then he encounters british armor there kind of uh, staging as an assembly area preparing for the next try we single handedly destroys uh five cromwell tanks uh, stuart m3s few of them a sherman firefly and many uh, british uh, uh, you know gun motor carriages and then bren gun carriers or uh, you know tractor and other uh, you know infantry support vehicles there single handedly and then he, uh, you know his tank eventually gets hit by a firefly and then he goes back to the german lines and comes back so there is an interesting uh, uh, story quick one here so uh, captain pat dias in one of those cromwells the four got hit this is a fourth one so it kind of uh, encounters a tiger and it fires two to three shells at close range and they are shocked that the shell simply bounces off the tiger one tank because of its thick armor and before he can load on to the fifth round the tiger turns and one fire one shot of the 88 mm gun armor piercing round pat dias simply gets blown out of the turret and goes flying he doesn't die his tank crew are killed 
and then uh, of course he is rescued subsequently and then uh, uh, this is where he himself narrates this and uh, such are the kind of a daring operations and kind of uh, tactics that the germans use there and they kind of begin to respect people like michael wickman and then you see very few germans being respected in world war 2 so he is one of them apart from rommel and then uh, operation market garden eventually france is you know taken over by the allies uh, much beyond their earlier plan uh, uh, so and then uh, the next battle is the operation market garden the objective here is to capture the bridges at arnhem is a british uh, operation here by uh, general bernard montgomery overall the operation is a failure and uh, here it's an intelligence failure as well because they failed to detect two very strong panzer divisions the 9th and 10th of the germans stationed around the area where the british armor and the infantry are going to be stationed and close to the arnhem so the route that they have to take is uh, and eindhoven nijmegen and then armen all three falling in a route and the british armor here follows a route which is again a single track a single column of tanks that's a very bad planning when you do not know what's the uh, uh, enemy armor or the anti tank weaponry that they're going to use where are the stations and the usual german tactic is when they see a column of tanks going hit the first tank hit the last tank and completely demobilize and the rest of them are stuck they don't know who's firing from there and easily to destroy it so this is where british armor takes a very big hit there and then uh, overall because of various reasons and strong reinforcements from the uh, from the uh, the germans there eventually arnhem bridge is not captured and this becomes a pain until 1945 for them that uh, this operation is an overall failure but uh, the british actually calls it a partial success uh battle of the bulge extremely important this is where the germans reach the end of the line of armor production they have all of the heavy armor here pulled into the battle the last gamble for adolf hitler 16 december 1944 the ardennes offensive they tried to take the same route to the ardennes in belgium and here the objective is to capture and reach the point of antwerp and here to cut off the allies and then split the armies into two so they can completely uh, starve them of the supplies and then this is only to force them into a kind of a pause where he can then focus until the allies recover to change his focus onto the eastern front where wave after where of the red army armor is uh, walking to and uh, moving towards berlin so here again initial 3 days thanks to bad weather allied air force is not in the air otherwise a rocket firing hawker typhoons or not would have come with just a tank killer and then uh, the other uh, aircrafts so they make use of this one good factor that works for the german in the initial stage which hitler kind of decides which is very different is he kinds of senses that his messages are being read by the allies and then uh, that's where he's encountering uh, defensive uh, positions and is pushed back so here all the messages instructions are highly secretive and are hand delivered not over the normal communication which can be intercepted now this is a very critical uh, strategy that the allies have actually won over uh, which i should have mentioned earlier it's called ultra so ultra is a scientific code breaking machine and a technique the allies successfully do in 1941 two years before Uh, the battle of course and uh, this is where every message being encrypted and communicated by the german hand command to the field units using their enigma are being encrypted and decrypted and messages immediately going out to the field units to tell them what the enemy is thinking what is their action this is one of the very strong reasons the allies are always prepared when the germans attack and actually the germans are still not aware that ultra has broken up the enigma code and they are able to intercept all of those messages but somehow during december 44 this is kind of uh, uh, viewed at and then the message is directly conveyed and even the soldiers on the front because they think somebody is going to defect and tell the russians and then it's kept a secret until the last moment the orders are not given as to where and what are they going to attack and initial 3 days tremendous success the americans in the ardennes forest are resting recuperating after the normandy battles take they take heavy casualties there so three pronged armor attack there three very strong armored divisions with waffen ss with all the best tanks and armored vehicles and an infantry only division there to tie down the enemy here and then they move on the first 3 4 days is success but eventually the weather clears up and then the germans run out of fuel so this is something they are racing against time 
and the strategy is you keep capturing enemy fuel dumps refuel yourself resupply go on to the next strategic objective that's the plan because they do not have fuel they are depending on the romanian synthetic fuel kind of things but again that's not effective so this is where at the end of the uh, war the battle here in the in a couple of weeks hitler realizes that the battle is uh, going out of control out of it the allies have taken over because of a lot of reinforcements from the british 21st uh, uh, army group and patton's third army moving up to support the americans there and the allies there and then the entire operation is kind of cancelled by hitler so uh, that's an important junction and this is a large major offensive and uh after this it's a complete uh, retreat there's a tactical win happens in january 1945 but again that's nothing to do with changing the uh, actual outcome of the war the battle of berlin this is where the russians after initial successes after kursk they begin their assault with the silo heights in april 1945 and it continues all along until the capture of berlin one mistake that the russians make again it's kind of execution the strategy is good but the execution fails when they go on to the battle of the offensive all of the armored units infantry and the support vehicles they have huge searchlights and then they try to use the searchlights to project on the target for the germans sitting on the silo heights they don't realize that in the dust and the hue the smoke these searchlights are actually highlighting the silhouette of all of the russian soldiers themselves to the germans uh, high on the silo heights and it presents themselves as a very good target for target practice by the german gunners so initially there is a lot of slowing down of the action there in the battle for the silo heights and marshal zukov was extremely uh, annoyed by this and then he puts in more force there and then eventually the drive goes on and which ends up to the battle of berlin up to capture of the reichstag now The Battle of Kursk is one of the biggest tank battle that people always talk about. It's Operation Citadel. So this is again an offensive after Stalingrad uh, debacle there. That and this is the largest tank where all of the armored units, approximately seven thousand odd units, uh, you know, take part in action on either side. So it's a battle that starts on fifth July. and it goes on to capture and surround the soviet army around the town of kursk so it's a salient so again the objective is two large armies ninth army and fourth army they do a pincer move here and they envelop the entire russian army is there and force them to surrender or annihilate them so this is a last ditch effort that hitler takes putting in all of his armor on the eastern front and uh, this again because of the uh, enigma code been broken the russians are well prepared in advance and they have several mines of layers of defensive uh, network set up and the germans encounter a lot of problems here to start with and this is where the Ger operation actually gets postponed by a couple of months as well from the germans which is uh, again a mistake why because they think their uh, new wonder weapon the best medium tank of the war the panther is supposed to enter into battle it's delayed by 2 months in production they also introduce a couple of tank destroyers there into battle but all of this do not actually fare very well all mechanical problems and they break down in the battle in the initial stages until later model comes up so 1943 uh, operation citadel ends up with the battle in a small town called prokhorovka where actually two armored units of the russian 5th or 8th guards tank army and the 4th panzer army from the south clash into each other and some of the russian uh, war veterans actually talk about it much decades after the war during the interviews and they think with their kind of uh, innocence of the level of education as you might imagine they actually think when they see so much of armor and battle going on oh my god this is the end of the world this is literally what they think from a russian's point of view they have never seen such a big battle they have never seen so much of armor clashing they think everything is going to come to an end but again here it's a war of attrition so the germans are not able to replace as much as the allies are able to do more and more reinforcements happens from the russian end and the germans keep losing eventually the germans and the russians after prokhorovka come to a kind of a standstill they are completely exhausted there are heavy losses on either side and then hitler cancels operation citadel eventually it immediately follows in the first week of august by a very heavy counter offensive by the russians and that sees the continual movement so two important things for the first time here the first time a german major offensive is completely stopped doesn't break through the enemy defense 
first time a summer offensive of russia is successful it's always a winter offensive supported by the weather they are supported here it's a comp- it's a success for them for the first time beyond this all of their offenses would be a success uh, in favor of the allies some of the key factors that i think are absolutely essential for you know success overall is that you know this is something very interesting that i read and i came across so after world war 2 between world war 1 and 2 you know there's a great depression financial depression that happens in 1929 and then a lot of unemployment takes place in europe a wall street crash and all of that and a lot of people educated people are unemployed this is where either the german general hans von sick kind of comes up with a concept saying in the rearmament program why don't we get these educated people into the german army they don't have a job let's capitalize on that get them employed we kind of give them a kind of a permanent employment they are willing to join here and that is why if you evaluate between an average russian soldier and a german soldier especially at the medium and high level commands the education level differs so russians are more or less conscripts they are not from any uh, uh, military academy or well educated but if you see the germans kind of a reason is for this that they have got a lot of educated people coming in who understand certain concept complicated strategy and all they think they would be useful in the leadership in the military in germany so that's a very important point technical advancements happen in terms of radio communication and tank development the germans kind of tend to overdo that over engineering the tiger tank takes enormous amount of hours to uh, develop because of a lot of over engineering that happens the tank uh, such is a fantastic weapon but again it's because of over engineering that it takes a lot of time so again it hampers development cost so for one tiger tank you actually could have developed a fighter aircraft or three assault guns that's a kind of equation this is where it's a numbers game so it's numbers game for the allies with 50000 shermans and 60000 russian tanks against 1300 347 tigers and other limited tanks so it eventually becomes a numbers game at the end because you focus on technology and the others are doing uh, in terms of numbers are gaining on that russian designs are simple because they know the crews are not so educated for them to understand a weapon and use it they make the design simple to use that's another concept there and then uh, documentation training field manuals are constantly upgraded and they're very uh, kind of uh, strictly followed by the germans here including simple instructions that if an assault gun unit tank unit needs refueling and all at least one tank would continue to remain on the battlefield to kind of serve as a morale boost to the infantry all of them should not be withdrawn until the reinforcement comes back these are simple things but it's well written here tanks should not be firing on the move because you won't get that accuracy you don't have that gun stabilizing factor yet into the german guns until late in the war of the other tanks so you can't actually fire accurately on the move so all of these things are well documented as in at field manuals and this is something that is to consider as well and command and control at a section level division level there is freedom to operate 10 people squad a section you have the freedom to flexible enough to operate if you have given an objective to capture a bunker you are free to operate the way you are there are no hierarchy bureaucracy there to restrict you are given these resources you just go and do the job so these kind of command and control positions and decision making at that level kind of makes a difference in the war for some of the armies here now with that uh, you know we come to the end of uh, the second world war and something that's kind of awaited here is the india context that we need to look at very strong this picture is uh, from the famous patnagar and you've got 93 to 100 tanks being destroyed here uh, by india uh, in the 65 war against pakistan that's why i kind of put up this uh, backdrop here so first let's take a look at the war against pakistan in 48 so it's where you know the fight takes place in zojila pass here and then it's kind of a key junction here where the pakistanis have uh, occupied here and then uh, the initial operation operation duck uh, by the 77th uh, brigade that kind of doesn't give success of it but again uh, it is uh, renamed as operation bison by uh, the lieutenant general karipa and then uh, here it's a recapture zojila pass and dras and uh, kargil sector from the map if you can see it's a line of uh, uh on a hill uh, territory into ladakh and to prevent and evacuate the pakistanis made them go back and then take back what eventually uh, they achieved doing so what 
what happens here is a remarkable feat. Uh, here they come up with an idea that uh, they've got their Stuart M5 tank, which is a light tank, of course. So the conventional artillery and uh, the infantry, they are not able to fire on to evacuate the Pakistani positions there. So they come up with this novel idea that why don't we take this tank up to that position and surprise, uh, give a surprise attack there. So this is achieved by dismantling the turret and the gun of the tank. It's kind of an operation where they uh, move the tank in parts, uh, in trucks, undercover in the night. And what's more important is, how do we get up to that pass? So the Madras sappers uh, comes into play here. They do a fantastic job here of converting a mule traverse track, which is rocky terrain, into a track that is kind of uh, portable by a uh, Jeep. So in essence, because a tank is not a very heavy tank, it doesn't made abroad a track that would suit this tank. And uh, you know, to be able to get to the spot is something that they do. And this is where they bring up the Stuart little tanks there. And then uh, they uh, reassemble that. And then the surprise attack begins on 1st November. And then because the Pakistanis simply do not expect this to happen, though the tanks are light, the Pakistanis do not have anything to counter the armor. And the firing begins there, supported by infantry weapons, of course, uh, artillery weapons as well, along with the tanks. And this is a landmark achievement uh, in one of our uh, tank warfares, that this tank is kind of effectively used at 11,000 plus feet high, which probably has never been attempted before by other armies to take it up a mountain and then dislodge the enemy. They eventually are successful there. The raiders are uh, chased away from that and retreated. Eventually, they link up with the rest of the army on 24th November. The picture on the right is one from one of those tracks of a Stuart M5 tank that are kind of projected there. The second one is 62 at Chushul. So this is kind of compared Historically speaking, I mean, people should understand this is very important because in the history of warfare, the Roman Empire, very strong in third century BC, had a sworn enemy, Hannibal of Carthage. He did a fantastic job of actually going up a mountain, the Alps, coming down and attacking Rome, and he took elephants with him. So in ancient world, nobody thought that elephants would go climb up a mountain, come down and attack. So he attacked Rome. So this battle is kind of com kind of compared by military historians to that kind of a historic feat. So here, on 20th October, they they realize that one of the Antonov uh, 12 aircrafts coming in at Chandigarh is kind of uh, uh, shot at by, and they see some bullet holes in it. Then they realize that Chinese have kind of come in and occupied some of the territories there. So this is where they think that the AMX-13 tank, so this is a light tank, a French tank, the 76 millimeter gun, effective gun, but light armored, but it's going to be used effective in this. So the plan is, let's take this tank, transport it in the aircraft, go to Chushul Valley and then support and block. So if you look at the map here, there is every reason that the Chinese can probably come in through this gap here between Gurung Hill and Magar Hill. So it's kind of armor uh, transportable here. And then uh, uh, if you look at the Chinese red dot here, that's where the Chushul Valley is. And this whole highway connects the Leh, uh, Ladakh uh, position and connects with the cut and then connects with Jammu eventually. And this area would be cut off if the Chinese manage to come here. Already in Tibet, up to Tibet, they are working on a highway plan there. So if you do not act fast, this is where decision making has to be taken how to get up the tanks there and stop the Chinese from incursion and stop them from this gap. So initially, they encounter a couple of problems when they try to load the tanks. The tanks, because of the tracks, they kind of slip off from the aircraft from the slope that they have to take. So again, innovation comes in. That's a very common Hindi word in the north here. So Lieutenant Colonel Gurbachan Singh comes up with a quick idea here and says, come on, let's get them somebody to build a ramp here. So it gets a carpenter, builds a ramp here, enables these tanks to be loaded effectively. It's a very difficult job still. It just can't ride in here. So the next problem that they encounter is if the tanks are all loaded up there, will the aircraft, the undercarriage and the tail section of the aircraft, would it collapse or not? How do we prevent that? Again, a kind of a wooden ramp arc is built to support the undercarriage until the tanks are loaded with sandbags and gunny bags to support that so that it doesn't sink under the when you load the tanks there. And then uh, once it is successfully loaded, the next problem that they encounter is this aircraft can carry 10 tons 
but probably when you load the tanks it probably exceeds that then there is stripping of the aircraft that takes place remove unnecessary armament armaments from the aircraft and other unnecessary parts that are actually not required to transport this the objective is to get the tanks there it is not going to encounter any enemy aircraft in the way so they immediately get to do that and then they are then they manage to transport the m6 am 13 tanks six of them there seven aircrafts are used and then the tanks start firing there once it lands there heavy engagement takes place there to prevent the chinese also to be uh, you know what is very important here at the same time at uh, rezingla the infantry are trying to stop the chinese incursion en masse infantry coming in this is where we have a major shaitan saying uh you know a squad of 120 infantry they're heavily outnumbered they're trying their best to fight out and then they hold that position as much as they can until uh they are completely surrounded and six of them are captured what we discover which is kind of very touching if you look at it eventually when historians others visit that immediately after this they still see those uh, dead soldiers there including uh, the major others some of the military doctors on the field they still have a kind of a cotton syringe in their hands the mortar team exhausts all of their mortars few of them are left he still has uh, a mortar or so lying beside him ready for that people are holding their rifles still or they are still having this they all die fighting until the last bullet to try their best to stop the chinese that's the best part about the courage and the last minute stand so it's compared with one of the last stands in the history of warfare which we talk about the greeks elsewhere but this is something that they are completely outnumbered and this fight here and here eventually the tanks are get there parallelly heavy bombardment starts here tanks start firing they defend the infantry on gurung hill eventually the chinese kind of take over that hill so they retreat behind two defensive positions so here captain uh, divan using one of his uh, amx 13 tank comes out with a kind uh, i mean a firing a tank which normally fires at 2 to 3 kilometers trajectory to fire at 8 kilometers defending the infantry to complete their retreat without casualties effectively and this he does on two three occasions on the chushul village here and then he successfully defends that from completely overrun and eventually on 21st november there is a cease fire and offensive operations end here so that's about the amx 13 tank that's about the way how we've picked this tank and taken up there is a historical moment of how we have defended that effectively now we get into uh, 1965 now the second encounter with pakistan so earlier we all know from history about uh, operation gibraltar and then as part of grand slam the intent to capture aknur bridge here <clears throat> and this is a very strategic where the uh, idea is to completely cut off india from jammu and kashmir and take them away from that and this is where we have a kind of an approach here as offensive is uh, uh, better uh, to, you know offensive is the best form of defense so three prong attack is something that is planned here and one of it is where the fourth mount mountain infantry division is sent down here to go into pakistan and then kind of infiltrate and then engage the enemy there so that the idea is with these attacks pakistan can divert their attention from aknur base they should divert their forces there because you can't let them capture the bridge there so this is the idea there so in this uh, here at kem karan sector initial pushback happens with the infantry division they come back to the kain karan sector and they set up very effective defense there at asal uthar near the village there and this is where nine deccan horse is also supporting the infantry there with the shamans there are a few amx 13 tanks as well and then the third cavalry here has the centurions so this is a new entry for the centurion tank in indian history it's a fantastic tank post world war 1 production i'll talk about that a little later about this tank so this is where a uh, heavy fighting takes place where they do encounter elements of the first armored pakistani division coming in here and then uh, defensive sector using the landscape is here a horseshoe kind of defensive position is set up by the indians here and then the field with the soggy mud in the sugarcane fields are utilized very well as a tactic so pakistani tanks get immobilized stuck in that and this is where in uh, using the strategy a uh, centurions open fire as the tanks but who actually takes away the action first and kind of uh, 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 comes up is uh, 
quartermaster Hamildar Abdul Hamid. So he is having among he's among the six uh, recoilless gun in among the one of the six jeeps that accompany uh, as a defensive position. So he starts firing at the Pakistani tanks here, and then he ends up destroying about seven tanks. So because of the mobility kill that we had, because of the soggy ground and the Centurions firing at the Patton tanks. So these are the M48 Patton tanks. That is very important to note. So 264 of these Patton's uh, tanks and Shermans and just with that. So, so this is where over a period of two days, heavy fighting happens. And then Abdul Hamid kinds of defense here. So first day, by the end of the day, he kills some of the tanks, about four or five. Next day, again, he kills the remainder of the tanks. And it is kind of said that among the last tanks that he fires at, it's a kind of simultaneous shot that takes place between him and the tank. The tank managers who hit his jeep because he's at that time continuously displacing his position and firing at them. But here the pattern tank locates him and then it fires. We don't know what happens to the patent tank, but eventually he is killed in action here. So inspiration is taken and this is where the rest of the Indian armored units fire back and they completely destroy. And then that's why we have so many of the patent tanks uh, as a patent graveyard, which eventually becomes patent nagar there. So with this, I'll move on to the rest of the battle here. In 65, it's important to combine the operations at Asal Uttar, Filor, and Savinta. It's kind of one followed one with the other, and dates are kind of overlapping here. And then uh, after the defeat at Asal Uttar by the Pakistan, and also the simultaneous attack that takes place by the Indian First Armored Division there, the objective is to attack the Sialko Court sector there, and then ensure that they effectively tackle the say, Pakistani Six Armored Division there. Of course, Pakistan has his air force coming into the play here, but it doesn't cause heavy damage to the Indian uh, armored dividends, but it does cause some damage to the infantry support vehicles there. And then after two days of heavy fighting there, we see that Pakistani armor kind of retreats over there, but eventually we end up destroying 66 tanks. We do lose some tanks, of course. And then uh, the 11th uh, Cavalry Regiment of Pakistan, it originally starts with this original strength of about uh, 45 tanks and all, but the end of this, it kind of almost ceases to be a cavalry regiment there because most of his tanks are destroyed by us. And then uh, they retreat to a place and that's where the, the battle at Chavinda also starts around the same timelines. So all of these battles are taking place where we have a victory at Asal Uttar. We kind of push back the Pakistan at Filora. And then we have Chavinda, where heavy uh, tank battle also takes place here. The objective is to cut off the Pakistani supply by taking over the Sialkot Pasro railway line. So the objective overall in the war is, a war is to ensure that Pakistani army does not again have a force to mobilize and attack India. They do not again attack to capture Jammu and Kashmir and effectively destroy that intention by them. And then defend and also kind of defend our forward positions like Patan Court. We have a base as well. So here, initial battle where we are able to punch through the Pakistani armor and kind of they lose 10 tanks. Next three days later, the six armor division kind of brings in reinforcements. Tank destroyers come into play here. So it's a kind of a weapon, an alternative weapon to tank. Its job is to encounter armor. So usually a tank destroyer doesn't lead an armored offensive, but it is to encounter armor. So I'll probably, if I have time, I'll show you a model of that a little later. So. There's again heavy tank battle that takes place at a uh, core level between India and Pakistan. And this is where it is led by Lieutenant Colonel Tarapur here. So between 11th and 16th September, that he ends up with his regiment leading from the front, destroying about 60 enemy tanks there. But um, in the action, he is hit by uh, the Pakistani and he is killed in action here. As a result of it, uh, the, it goes on into further reinforcements happening around 21st of September. It reaches a kind of stalemate, heavy losses on both the sides. They sit back, resolve, look at the offensive on where it is. And then actually the war just ends with inconclusiveness. There is no outright victory, but it's kind of a tactical win for us. But again, the task and agreement comes in. We have captured Filora. We have four or five villages. We have got about 500 square kilometers. We are forced to return that to Pakistan. So that's the tank battle in 65 between the three places, uh, which is uh, very important for us. And we have seen the centurions how they have performed here. 71, this is very important because again, we encountered Pakistan this time on the East. So here, Mukti Bahini is a kind of a force, rebel force in Bangladesh that is there kind of picks up 
because of the atrocities and the pakistani policy that is there they come up with the rebel uh, of gorilla warfare there and this is where kind of we step in and try to help them out and then then the northeast part at garipur this is where the new tank comes into the indian uh, armored regiments the t55 so this is a well thought about process by the government where in advance they have procured this t55 tank it is a state of the art at that time in the cold war after the second world war and this tank kind of has his own history being one of the best tanks around that period influences the allied western armor development that's the effectiveness of this tank when it comes into design one of the most widely used tank across the world the one of the wide you know one of the most produced as well about 1 lakh units are produced between russia poland and czechoslovakia so here uh, we encountered the pakistanis when we attacked them as a surprise on uh, on 20th and 21st november it's actually ahead of the actual declaration of war on 3rd december here so it's supported by the 14 panda battalion and then we have the pt76 so this is an amphibious light tank again from russia and then it's quite effective because it's it's kind of a stream and river kind of country there in bangladesh not a very typical open country as we see in the west so this tank is mostly used for recons and then for ambush and other traversing across okay. such terrain and this kind of proves useful in that battle and then here we kind of uh, encounter the pakistanis coming up for the m4 chaffee light tank again an american tank here but they are absolutely no match for the t55 main battle tanks and then uh, the uh, the b squadron from the 63rd cavalry here uh, takes this d55 battle tanks and has a score over the m24 chaffees and then it's a victory there and then uh, the 14th punjab battalion they are completely outnumbered but it is said they have very good dug in positions here and they do not let the pakistanis out flank them and they put up very strong resistance something that is to be uh, uh, spoken about here and one of the reasons why we we end up kind of with a very good tactical tactical win with the pakistanis on the eastern side with 14 pakistani tanks destroyed some are captured as well now uh, major baldit uh, daljit singh narang he is in one of these tanks directing operations there uh, on the pt76 when there is machine gun fire raking up and then he struck and he is killed on top of his tank Uh, and then colonel siddu is wounded in action on uh, when he uh, takes forward his tank as well so this action on the east kind of infuriates the pakistanis and they want to pull the uh, indian armor away uh, from them to may, may achieve their objective in bangladesh so they start offensive operations on the west so this is where another big tank battle in history after the kosk and asal uttar is a battle of basantar so it is around the tributary of the river ravi there this river basantar is so it is also called the battle of the shakargar bulge so this is where we encountered one of the biggest tank battles here between 4th december and all and then here the objective again here uh, for the indian the army is to uh, encounter the pakistanis around this and then we go in with two armored brigades but the pakistanis come in with one armored division and then one armored brigade both one core from the armored divisions and then the objective is to prevent and go towards sialkot capture and prevent them from coming up to patan court and then defending the indian territories there and the most important aspect is we have to build a bridge and bridge the basantar river and this is where it's heavily mined and then we have some t55 tanks from the 7th cavalry and then uh, uh, flail tanks basically uh, to clear the mine fields here so the target is to clear about nine uh, channels open for the indian army to move ahead over there and then uh, they start clearing this uh, supporting the they are attached to the 16th uh, armored brigade here and the 54th uh, infantry division as well here so when this happens here there is they are doing this under heavy fire from pakistanis so lieutenant arun khetarpal 21 year old tank commander takes his tank uh, associated with the 17 punna horse with two other tanks in his troops and simply attacks the pakistanis here and then this is where they are surprised by this attack but they throw in all of their armor and he managed to destroy about 10 pakistani tanks in this firefight that happens one of the last tanks that he encounters actually fires off a shot and at around the same time he fires but the pakistani tank shot hits his tank this is where he is killed in action and uh, uh, he is a uh, paramvir chakra awardee as well a fantastic effort uh, by the uh, 21 year old tank commander here now this kind of inferiority pakistanis by the tank losses they 
four and more armored divisions here they actually have a four phase tank battle planned out offensive from there and stretching up to december 16th different phases one of the last cavalry charges take takes place is uh, uh, i kind of forget his name maybe lieutenant colonel uh, uh, akram raja or somebody from the pakistan he does a typical cavalry charge with his tank but the indian territory is well defended and fight of that that's one of the last attacks that the pakistanis do on a do or die basis and we destroy 46 tanks there and it is a decisive <coughs> victory for the indians there on the western sector in the battle of basantar here so uh, with this uh, we finish off the actual key battles that the indian tanks have been involved in across the decades just to talk about a little bit about the tanks we spoke of this is a centurion tank this is rated as among the best post second world war tank developed in the overall model competitive and then the t55 here is something that is used by india in the battles that you have seen again it's a fantastic russian tank that develops during the cold war here so there is a history behind this it's an evolution of the tank from the t34 85s and the subsequent production the joseph salen tanks and all so this is among the new concept with the kind of a, a semi hemispherical uh, turret that we have a very good gun 100 mm and then what happens is very interesting here both of these are used by indians but the background is around 1956 the hungarian revolt takes place in europe initially started with the students movement there because they don't like the russian who control uh, the area with their policies and what happens here is the russians drive some of this t55s into hungary into the british embassy uh, premises there this is where the british take a look at this tank they say oh my god this is a state of the art t55 that goes into back to britain that information they start enhancing the tank tank program and enhance the centurion so in 1959 or so the uh, the 84 mm uh, caliber of the gun is immediately upgraded to 105 mm of the centurion so that's the interesting part of how t55 influences the upgrade of the centurion the british armor the upgrade of the centurion also enables for them to also stop production of another fantastic tank that they actually start which is called the conqueror program the british conqueror tank and then uh, they continue with this and the successor of this eventually as you know is a chieftain which gets into the cold war so that's a little bit about these tanks and then we are lucky to have had these two tanks in our regiments which are world world renowned for their own piece of history now after this uh, we look at the last great tank battle that is there which is the gulf war so in this we are going to look at the uh, battle against iraq the gulf war so operation desert shield is followed by operation desert storm so the head of the coalition forces here general norman swarskov so he plans his offensive action where he has to drive the iraqis out of kuwait so he has a three prong attack here of course here you should not uh, forget that we are in an age of battle these are the modern tanks by the way and the concept of main battle tank comes into it i'll talk a little bit about this once i finish this so the battle of it's called the battle of 73 easting so 73 easting is not the name of the place i mean it's more for a civilian friends here to understand so when you are in a in an unmapped or uncharted territory which is not a town which is typical of the desert area you have to go by the mapping concept so it's longitudes and latitudes x and y axis so 73 eastings is actually a representative of 73 x axis horizontal that's pointing towards the location where this battle takes place in the desert warfare here so it's an armored offensive coalition forces the m1 abrams tank the new weapon of war that comes up from the americans the challenger one the british the armored divisions so they take part in this so initial squadron the recon's armored unit of the americans they encounter initial defenses of pakistanis they do away with that because and then the real struggle happens the challenge with the uh, republican guards of the iraqis equipped with the t72 tanks so iraqis have their own t55 modified versions there but they are kind of outdated at this point of time so we are talking about 1991 not 19 uh, 
65 or 71 anymore so these tanks are kind of outdated they are still used at highly upgraded versions in some countries so the offensive offensive began with casual shelling and aerial bombardment so the f117 nighthawk the stealth fighter bomber also makes his entry here and makes a big impact with a lot of bombing that it does on the ground troops here and then this drive towards kuwait enables the iraqis to be cut off and destroyed in iraq Uh, and also to prevent the retreating uh, iraqi armies from kuwait getting into iraq so this kinds of ends in a big success for them <coughs> sorry for the gulf war and then they capture a lot of iraqis destroy a lot of iraqi armored vehicles so t72 tank is also a not a match for the uh, m1 abrams tank here and the british challenger so the record of one of the tank kills here that it hits a t55 at a 400 kilometers range with a armor piercing are uh, discarding sabo round so this is where you know we come to the concept of uh, main battle tanks so towards the cold war that begins between end of 50s and early 60s i'm trying to go a little fast here i know we are running out of time here but it's important to understand here so we don't have any more of the concepts in tank design light medium heavy all of that and then they realize all of these countries that at a point of time your medium tank with better equipped armor and caliber actually can dish out a lot of punishment and why do we need to go for heavy and heavier tanks why don't we improvise in terms of mobility armor protection and firepower so they improvise upon that and they come back to saying that a kind of 45 to 55 tons tank is good enough and let's call this a main battle tank so the main battle tank concept is standardized between the 50s and 60s in the cold war era that is why after that you don't see much of the tanks being called in terms of light medium heavy you always refer to them as mbts associated with whatever text that you may encounter here so uh, with that i'll just move on to some of the interesting uh, pictures that i have so these are the last of the land tank battles that i thought these are essential it's a kind of pick and choose that i had to do there are a lot of battles as well just to name a few battle in the 1960s against israel the golan heights the yom kippur war the 73s uh, war where some of the world war 2 tanks were used and uh, you know jordanians and israelis fighting and the korean war of course in the 50s where everybody realizes that tanks are still an essential part of the ground force that's an important decision that takes place in the korean war because the atomic bombs usage in august in second world war people thought that oh maybe the next war is going to be a nuclear or atomic war but no the country is kind of dissuaded and they do not use atomic weapons so the m26 pershing it's a kind of uh, heavy tank it was the end of the war second world war it comes to effect still used in the korean war that is where they realize that perhaps the tanks cannot be do done away with we still have to go along with the tank programs in each of the countries that's why tanks keep evolving over the ages there some of the interesting pictures uh, i hope you are able to see uh, so i'll try to explain left side top picture is from the first world war so this is where i said the germans had no anti tank weapon to encounter initially at somme and cambrai you see a british tank there uh, and then you have a german ock flare or infantry uh, firing a flame through at this tank so they basically are throwing anything and possible to stop the british tank advancing towards them and the right side a top is a tiger tank tiger one in russia it has just destroyed a russian tank at a considerable distance very strong 88 mm gun and the americans tend to call the germans tend to call the sherman tanks and tanks as a tommy cooker it's like a pressure cooker so they all know one shot from a german 88 it simply blows it apart and the american tank crew are simply not happy with this tank that's another big story on that the americans think that mobility is important in a mobile warfare and they are they struggle and there is enormous amount of casualties that takes place and this tiger tank kinds of uh, you know uh, creates a phobia over there the picture below that is very interesting and the one below that that's winston churchill looking at a german 88 anti tank shell standing on top of a german tiger this is i think in north africa and below is king george the 6th peeping into a commander's cupola of a tiger one tank again so tiger 131 that's a tiger tanks a number there it is captured in north africa being shot at by one of the armored regiments of the british the tank is abandoned in an intact condition it's brought to tunisia and to britain for studies so every country is doing that in the war they take captured tanks 
take it to their uh, armored units and uh, like aberdeen proving grounds in the us or bovington and then russia and the tests are carried out against anti tank weapons to study the enemy tank to see what's so fantastic about this tank then the design goes into those three factors which i uh, you know kind of explain to upgrade into the next tank that's how tank development takes place learning from the battlefield if you get an example fantastic study that and improvise so this is where the tiger kinds of kind of creates a phobia to the extent that bernard montgomery actually tells the british press not to print good things about the tiger tanks victories and suppresses that because he doesn't want the british troops and the media to get demoralized by looking at tiger victories being printed in a british newspaper that's a kind of fear factor that this tiger tank creates in the war the left is something that i spoke about documentation so if you look at uh, uh the uh, document here on the left side it's called panther clinic so it's 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 a page that i pulled out it it is about tank maintenance manual for the german to make it look like a cartoon because they think looking at 100 page manuals would be very boring for a tank man they try to make it look cartoonish and interesting so that people will start looking at the pictures try to understand what it is eventually read take interest in studying the manuals that's a very innovative way of creating a manual i would say and then at the bottom is actually a german uh, unit from first world war they are behind uh, one of the first captured british tanks the mark force this is where again as i say they study the enemy tank few more pictures top left corner is a centurion you see our indian kind of probably the as an assembly area the call is given to get on to the tanks and uh, then get moving so you see them rushing on to board you know getting on to the tanks to get to their uh, position uh, rally position there that's a picture that i pulled out the right side top is from asal uttar it's a kind of interesting touchy picture after asal uttar it's ridden with pattern tanks there you can see the damaged pattern tanks some of the villagers sitting there in asal uttar looking at it they don't know what it is kind of proves to be pretty interesting for me that's why i kind of put up that picture there it is also sometimes called the people swar in 65 because the villagers actually help supply food and rations for the indian units there defending that unit at asal uttar the picture at the center is from the m3 stuart little in 1945 so this is where one of the pictures is how the m40 uh, m3 stuart little uh, tanks are taken up there and used against the pakistanis there and the pt76 on the right you see it crossing a kind of a watery area there in bangladesh so that's where it's an amphibious vehicle which is kind of useful to cross those kind of streams and lakes the left side bottom is a modernized version of the t55 iraqis it's completely blown up and burning uh, probably through a hit by a challenger or an abrams tank in the iraq war left side is how a massive build up of coalition forces in the gulf war with the entire us armored brigade there about to launch operation desert storm well with that i come to the end of the presentation i i'll stop sharing my screen now so probably we can have a quick chat yep. uh, so i hope uh, ladies and gentlemen it was well and informative i know i've gone uh, well beyond the time and i want to finish minutes. as much as possible i know <laughs> it's a very vast topic sorry for that so i couldn't miss things out and we actually left out a lot of things as i said and then my slides actually ran out for a few more slides which our captain said no cut it short so you know this is the maximum justice i could do in the short time so i'm welcome for any ah, feedback okay. or anything Anyway, absolutely, you carried the day. Absolutely um, brilliant, excellent presentation, Mr. Anand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anand. If I may say so, now you have proven that even uh, subjects like military history and warfare can be taught online. So this is a note I'll tell the Department of Defense Studies in Madras University. <laughs> you recorded this. Black boards anymore, sir? I have a few questions. Yeah, yeah, not not few. Yeah. One question per per you know, <laughs> ask one question. All right, uh, sir. During uh, World War Two, uh, Germans uh, and uh, the Russians, even the British and the Americans, produced the uh, super heavy tanks such as uh, Maus E hundred and uh, Tog two KV five and all. So, in all the super heavy tanks, from your point of view, which would you think would be the best in uh, the battle? 
all of these super heavy tanks actually mouse and others did not see action in world war 2 and then when it becomes yeah. in world war 2 a war of attrition you had to have the most effective tank that's where the germans at least stopped with their heavy tank the britishers had their numbers game to play with so effectiveness to end the war was more of a question rather than investing more money into a much heavier tank that is why the evolution in the cold war looked at why do we need to build bigger and heavy tanks when you can actually uh, improvise in technology on an available tank at a medium weight and use it more effectively so to answer your questions you don't need the tanks that are two story high and having a 700 mm guns you had ammunition calibers improving like uh, armor piercing discarding sabo armor piercing discarding sabo where fin stabilized you know those kind of innovations and technology we proved effective and uh, kind of uh, zimmerat the anti tank mine paint that they applied it's a protective armor you're not thickening the armor by a great extent you're sloping you have a sloping armor to pick off and deflect shells so it's Good innovation question. that takes place here so the right is a panther tank is a panther d model this is a russian t3485 uh, so if you see the concept of slope armor is being copied from the russian tank to the german tank this is the best among the best medium tanks on the war and this is the best overall tank of the war in terms of simplicity of production about 60000 units produced highly upgradable and effective in the war the sides armor cuttings as what i told you innovatives this called shoots and armor cuttings in the side to deflect some of the infantry weapons so usually the heavy armor is in the front is considerably less armor in the sides and the rear portions so if you have to hit a effective tank you have to get onto the flanks or the rear side as i explained yeah, go. this is this is an assault gun a storm geschutz so this is an infantry vehicle in world war 2 actually these encountered for a large number of kills on the eastern front and enemy tanks these are kind of underestimated we talk about tigers but this have a 75 mm gun this if you see the chassis this is actually a panzer 3 chassis so this is when i said when your panzer 3 tank as a tank is no longer effective on the field to lead an offense you remove the turret upgun it so removing the turret means you are able to load a heavier gun that's one of the concepts in tank design so you load a 75 mm gun highly effective low silo head and the crew simply loved it and this is one of the books that says one of these tanks always has to be along with the infantry should not leave the field and high moral boosting for the infantry in world war 2 by the germans here this piece of equipment this is a marder this is a tank destroyer so you saw an assault gun you saw a tank this is a tank destroyer so here it's czechoslovakian chassis zek 38t again it's outdated obsolete so you dispense with a turret you build a citadel and then this is german engineering here this is a russian 76 mm gun so it's a czechoslovakian chassis body russian 76 mm gun and then it's overall german engineering and this proves to be effective this marder 3 very effective as a tank killer but one flaw it's an open turret so you see the gunner the loader tank they are not protected so it's an open fighting compartment this is where if you allow infantry to come in and you're very close to enemy infantry they can easily throw a molotov cocktail or grenades and a uh, kind of destroy or disable this tank but this okay. is one of the family of tank destroyers that was effective in terms of using multiple countries technologies and to prove how effective it was in battle now this one this is actually a monster it's again a tank destroyer called ferdinand or elephant elephant yes this is your famous uh, tiger one uh, it's got a russian winter uh, uh, slow camo uh, paint on it and uh, these are basically the chassis from the same panzer commission the same tiger program so 80 of uh, the chassis are actually built because hitler calls henschel and porsche porsche designs cars and other things now but ferdinand and porsche is hitler's friend so he gives him an option you come up with a design henschel company comes up with this design so in the field trials he chooses henschel that's a resultant of this tiger which is actually a very good decision and uh, porsche says i have built 80 chassis what am i supposed to do with it so hitler thinks over and says come on i need a tank destroyer why don't you put an 88 mm on it and give me the result is a ferdinand named after porsche eventually 
actually it's called an elephant so 80 of this uh, 40 of this go into the kursk battle this is again a new entry into the kursk battle in 3043 many of them are kind of mechanical failures and encountered not properly field tested and then it doesn't even have a machine gun on the top if you see a turret now this has got an mg34 on top to fend off infantry this does not have it also got a coaxial and a bow machine guns this doesn't have so this kind of proves a loss russian infantry come up and kind of disable these tanks so 40 more are taken back out of the battlefield they are kind of remodified and then sent to italy to counter the anzio landings by the uh, allies in italy subsequently so that's a little bit about these two tanks the same thing actually happens with the king tiger program as well uh, and then incidentally i've got uh, this uh, king tiger model here as well uh, so it's the heaviest tank on the battlefield by the germans a massive l7188 gun uh, allies called it as long as a telegraph pole that's a kind of a name they gave it very effective very thick armor here but again mobility issues it kind of uses the maybach engine and the same that is used on the tiger this is 58 tons this is 69 tons so obviously the same engine is going to hamper us uh, mechanics and mobility so it contains lot of uh, failure inside and european battlefields have lot of rivers and streams and bridges that cannot take 68 tons it's kind of a disadvantage again in terms of mobility you can't transport the tanks wherever you want seize action in july in normandy very effective long range one of this gets captured eventually again by the allies and studies go into it so if you see the design again it's uh, interwheel interlock road wheels so this is again a new uh, kind of technology by the germans to distribute the heavy weight of the tank and uh, very few numbers are built about 400 plus 1030 of the tigers very few numbers to make an effect but the allies find it very difficult five four to five enemy tanks have to encounter and destroy one of these tanks so again it's a numbers game at the end of it all uh that's it uh, friends that's these are the quick models that i rushed and brought along when and uh, air marshal sir you would be glad i've got world war through aircraft i've got the first aircraft airplane by the right brothers as well and uh, some of it uh, you know we have the p51 spitfire hurricanes uh, all of that i've got including the b17 the workhorse the famous your know, dc3s all of that i've got as well so you'll probably enjoy that part as well when you visit home sometime Thank you. Certainly, you'll know much, much more than I do. <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> yeah. So we got just just about a couple of minutes. If there are any more questions, because we have already gone on to nearly two hours. Sir, a question. Yeah, yeah. One more. That's it. Uh. Uh, during uh, the Vietnam War, the uh, Sheridan tanks, the American Sheridan, Sheridan tanks, yes. they were Sheridan. having the ATGM. so they were actually para dropped on them on the so do you think that the fourth generation tanks such as the cv120 and uh, plio one uh, the polish tank and the norwegian tank even the m14 armata do you think that uh, will they have this uh, feature of uh, para drop from uh, either c17 or illusion 76 okay so this entirely depends on uh, the battle scenario and then availability of armor at that point of time time and how you mobilize your forces to encounter the enemy so again it goes into a lot of intelligence and planning so you can't sit and wait until somebody comes up and you rush we are no longer in a kind of an age where you can keep lift and shifting tanks through the air here of course having said that uh, if, i mean others can correct me here i haven't spoken about the t72 but uh, the illusion 76 aircraft helped us transport some of these tanks into sri lanka for the ipft peacekeeping force i think about seven of seven of them were airlifted and then uh, i think uh, one of our uh, major call or somebody actually were hit by one of uh, rpg there on this t72 and then he lost one of his eyes i mean that's one of the incidents that i uh, refer of course they came back uh, by sea so uh, i mean not all tanks uh, uh, can, you know is very good to keep on depending on airlifting but it depends on the aircraft depending on how much of armor you need and what you can do at that point of time so it all depends on the battle scenario there Right. and of course i i i say i just saw one question from the commodore here uh, what about the naval models so i'll have to answer this i covered yeah, the army yeah. and go, the air force so uh, are you still online sir no i think he's he's left oh, okay but i do have the bismarck 
uh, the German great battleship. I have the flagship uh, HMS Hood model, and I've got uh, the flagship uh, Japanese uh, battleships as well. Uh, um, you know the uh, Yamato and uh, uh, Akagi uh, aircraft carrier. Some of the ships are also there. I've got some more, uh, you know, in my other house there. But yes, five or six ship models are also there here. Thank you. It is a wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation, Anand. I mean, you have uh, proved worthy of my my confidence to sort of uh, <laughs> take so a can chance. I, can, I, have... can I say I'm the first civilian guinea pig for you? Yes, <laughs> no, yes, in a way, I was uh, try, trying, you know, something like that. Now, next in line is Ram Ramani. So we better uh, sort of <laughs> get ready. So when I fly, so we, we are bringing. Yes, ma'am, you we were trying to say something. Yeah, Sorry. it is so nice to hear a non army person so good about the times and all. This is uh, really worth listening to you. So nice. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. I mean, it's all, you know, reading and reading and reading. It's very complicated. <laughs> and let me, I mean, very important thing. I didn't say this. What I tell you today might be different what I tell you two years later. This is exactly what's happening. His military historians are constantly evolving around it. So, Captain, the, the new story is since 2007 onwards, Kursk is kind of no longer the biggest tank battle. And they've oh, kind see. of inflated the numbers is what historians are coming out because of the Russian archives being opened to the public slowly now. Oh, Second is, until 2011, the ones who manufactured the Tiger II tanks, it was being called as Henschel and uh, Porsche, and uh, the turret and gunnery. In 2018, when I saw the documentary, it's no longer Henschel and Porsche. That's a kind of a wrong communication the British Tank Museum presenters were giving out. So as we go through year on year, things are changing in terms of facts from a historical perspective, because a lot of research is going on. Who actually destroyed what tank? A lot of research is going on. Who killed Michael, Michael Wickman? Actually saying, why? what was this regiment, tank regiment claiming? What were they doing there? Were they supposed to be there? They say they claim. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have faced the... Uh, I do not know whether you can hear me. Yes, yes we can. We, we can uh, unfortunately, I have faced the wrath of the Ahmed Corps rather than the praise of the Ahmed Corps because I have faced the bullets of your Ahmed Corps. <laughs> that I, as, a, as a poor infantryman, I was in the wrong side. You were all firing at me and I had to face them. So I got a lot of time for you. Yeah, you destroyed two tanks. Why didn't you tell them you destroyed the two tanks? <laughs> that's uh, that's a, I wouldn't be like to blow my own trumpet. Uh, well, that's a part of the game. Well, I know Chris's story. And uh, in uh, the uh, battle of, uh, what's that road, sir? Jaydepur, Dhaka. Uh, on that uh, Jaydepur to Dhaka, they uh, destroyed uh, two of the Pakistani tanks. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, so I you, you must hear about it. I actually had an ambush and I was successful in the ambush and two tanks got destroyed. That's all I can say. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, that, but that's an achievement by an infantryman. Sir, I even read in the website that uh, you took a megaphone and uh, you said to surrender. Well, that's a story that I'll tell later. Not this time, we are getting extra time. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So, but uh, big, uh, big thanks, uh, Captain, uh, sir. I think uh, your inputs, at least on the Indian side of things, what to pick and choose was absolutely essential. Very, very useful. Otherwise, this would have been probably a four-hour presentation otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> and then just one small uh, observation, if I may. Yeah, please, please. I'm uh, getting into this webinar more nowadays. There's a lot of text in your PPT which makes me confused whether I should read your screen or I should hear what you say. Oh, so text, yeah. for, for, for all the veterans here, I mean, people with so much knowledge, the only thing I would recommend is minimize the text on the screen so that we have the pleasure of hearing you. Okay, so that, that's, focus that, on what yeah, okay, that's one of my <laughs> tactics actually. <laughs> because, 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 because for the Indian battles, I knew that we are going to run out of time. So I put in all the text as much as possible so that if you depend on my saying we run out of time, I would have to cut short my speech and then you would miss out, miss out on the essentials. That is why I pasted what, what right. possible things I want. At least you can read and cover things. Yeah. Essential yeah. things are not left yeah, that, out entirely. That was my tactic. It happens when you write about battles, it happens. You know, it's difficult to narrate <laughs> the whole thing, so you got to write. Wonderful. So, so, Mr. Yeah. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful uh, lecture.
I don't think even uh, any, I think Ami guy would know so much. <laughs> yeah. today. This is really great. I am really impressed. Really yeah. humbled, uh, uh, sir, on this. But I think our, our, our captain, sir, is a. Uh, Uh, is very hard in terms of uh, knowledge on this otherwise he is my inspiration at this point of time with the little knowledge that i have that i kind of overcome that by going through constant learning and all uh, a funny thing let i you know i will take a few seconds more weekly id pandradalna avalukku theriyada how important is it so when i keep looking at documentaries sometimes they come and say enna na eppa var summa birangi patti id patti paathun irukken so you know it is a funny statement but eventually you know that passion and thing drives and then constant learning is something we have to give otherwise it's actually very easy to forget so many things have taken place over a period of time and then it's very easy to forget you know? i hope she doesn't call you birangi anand <laughs> so he, he, you see, I, I mean, just to uh, the first time when he came, you know, he had uh, his uh, uh, Ria, his daughter was. Uh, 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 I I knew you didn't say this. I was thinking, why are you not saying he, this? <laughs> he he left his mother-in-law and the child in the car and came with his wife there, and we were talking. And she wanted. She was rusty. She wanted to go. Then you realize this. He left, kept the child in the car, and he is he kept on talking. I said, "Come on, have a heart. At least bring them here." <laughs> so that is the kind of you know. Once he get involved, and he, he, his wife says that once he starts this, he, he forgets everything else. So that is that. That's what Anand is. So. Great encyclopedia is an encyclopedia. I would yes, say. Yes, yes, I'm. I'm. Come on, sir. Is... Way, way to go. Way. One or two breaks. I don't know whether you covered this. There is a basic difference between the way how the uh, Americans design the tanks and the. Oh yes, yes, yes. Manufacturing actually. So yeah. the manufacturing of the Americans they gave this uh, uh, this project to automobile industries. You know, Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors. Is it that against the Germans giving it to heavy industries? No, what I was, what I am coming to the end. While designing the tank, the uh, uh, the Russians, you know, they don't keep in mind the crew comfort. Ah, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So yes. first, they lay down the dimensions of a tank, yes. you know, so that it doesn't give a big sellout for to get hit. And yes. inside that, they try and put in all those, you know, equipment and guns and uh, navigation things and all that. And what happens is the uh, crew comfort suffers. Mm, But where? Yes, yes. Take an you know, American tank. American tank. Firstly, they need to have certain air conditioning. They need to have some food warmers and things like that. So they have the uh, the basics for a crew comfort, which is they put it. Then thereafter, they get the uh, dimensions. Therefore, they, you always yeah. find the American tanks are little, you know, bigger. Crew oriented, you know, uh, you know, people oriented. I can say, like uh, I think the Israeli tanks are also trying to bring the engine to the front because they think that crew is uh, safety is primary. So if an AP shell hits, it will probably destroy all the machinery and the heavy Man, metal in the front, and people can be safe. And can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, now, not actually a question. You know, I was just trying to find out. I got disconnected for last five minutes. Yeah. You know why is that uh, Mr. Anand did not join the army? Yeah. Why didn't you join the army? He's asking. Uh, I think one of the reasons being the only child, uh, you know, the physical injury risk, and then uh, now nobody to carry forward is probably conventional and conservative approach that we normally have in the south. Uh, you know, that's one thing, and then that's the reason. See, see Brigadier Varadhan is here. He's a nice cricketer. So. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, you, 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 you are like Abdul Kalam. I'd like to say. Something. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I would like to tell uh, all of you that I am a chap who has taken part in tanks in tank warfare in the Battle of Basant. Yeah, but, oh, I was yeah. just about to say that. Yeah. I was, I was very much in the tank, and my God, the type of firing that I've seen, I don't think any of you would ever see. but we had the great advantage of having all artillery which was within range with about 7 uh, or 8 medium regiments then were firing at rate rapid it is something like 10 rounds per minute or something like that you can imagine 200 pounds and 100 pound shells landing in the same area and that was the time when both sides the enemy armor was coming in and our own chaps we had hodson on on the left and we had um, uh, um, uh, no. Tuna horse on the right 
Yeah, and I was very much there, very, very much there. Two of my OP officers got their wheel chakras. And um, so you can imagine the type of fighting that actually took place. I really don't know how I'm alive to talk to you today. God bless you. <laughs> yes, no. words, uh, it, happy it Onam, Joe. You started off with Happy Onam. <laughs> yes, that I was more, so. It was the most firo, undoubtedly most ferocious battle of the 1971. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. My God, I, I, especially the infantry, the way they fought. I, I am all praise for the way the infantry fought, especially the grenadiers. I mean, they did a magnificent job. And uh, anyway, there's, it's, there's a lot more to that. I don't, I don't have the time now, but sometime I'll figure something out and try and tell you exactly what happened, including the follow-up. Next morning when we met the Pakistanis after the ceasefire, what happened and what type of conversation uh, we, took place between them and us. It's a very interesting thing. I will talk to you over a drink in, in Palm Grove Institute as and when they opened. Why don't you give us a presentation on that And what wonderful to hear that, uh, sir. And I think this is exactly what I was telling uh, Colonel I'm... Sir Krishnaswamy at the beginning, that whatever I may say and know is nothing compared to what you have actually experienced. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, uh, <coughs> I, uh, you know, the uh, Colonel John Puri, you know, yeah. Longe Wala. Longe, yes. Longe Wala. You know, I Longe Wala. him. In, when we were in Mao, we were together as instructors in the peace wing in infantry school Mao. Oh. And the way he used to talk about the tank battle that took place, just one single strand of wire, can you beat it, which they had put for uh, to stop the donkeys and the wild animals coming into the post. This Pakistan, that it is a, you know, it's a minefield. Mine, it's a, a drip wire. Mm. No, you didn't cover that particular battle of Longeval. It was a wonderful uh, you know, battle. Mm. What wonderful battle from the sense of uh, Pakistani tank losses. Sorry, sir? Wonderful from the point of Pakistani tank losses. They almost uh, lost an entire brigade. I mean, yeah. That is thanks to the Indian Air Force, Ramu. Thanks yeah, to the Indian Air Force. Following, following day. No, but I think, but the, I think the hold up, the initial uh, hold up was, was, hold up somebody, was huh? yes, yes. I think that was crucial to wait at least until yes, the yes. Air Force can hit them the following day morning. I, he also sent out patrols and, you know, the entire interview, and he was able to sort of monitor the entire situation. The holding. So stories and stories of uh, how, you know, one of the tanks had, you know, parked like this, party tanks, you know, who was trying to assault. And that particular tank kept running, 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 and poor Shahs did not know how to put it off. They tried to open the diesel tank and drain out the diesel. <laughs> it, the engine was idling for about four or five days. This is time it, you know, stopped on its own. Because the diesel got uh, drained. Uh, so such stories used to come out with. I know this. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, wonderful, uh, Mr. Anand. Really. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed the conversation. I wish I was in Madras uh, many more years earlier or met you all. Probably, uh, I would have had more complaints from the house. Uh, what are you doing outside? Come back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everybody for right. attending, and, attending and appreciating because you know this is the first experimental case of presenting you know professionals from you know in, in, because all our programs you are presenting veterans so I decided to take a you know deviate from that path. So now we're going to have more people coming in with uh, and incidentally please try and uh, join uh, next week's program on naval mine warfare. We got uh, another new priest coming in. He's Commander Hector Popper. So he is also Wonderful. an import. Wow. Huh? He, is, he is also an import to Madras. I mean, I'm bring, I'm, I'm not bringing him. He's speaking from Bangalore. You know, like General Kamath did last time. So he's a Bangalorean. I'm rather settled there. So that that should be an interesting program equally. So please do join. We are, I'm trying. We are trying to innovate something. Uh, you know, from standard. Battle history, so you are saying something more. Make him proceed. Please join. I mean, today's attendance was very encouraging. We had nearly 50, 45, or something like that. Oh, what we start checking. Next time onwards, it will be all right. We put in some other system. It's not, it, it is always delayed.
ದ್ರಾವಿಡ ಉತ್ಕಲ ವಂಗ ವಿಂದ್ಯ ಹಿಮಾಚಲ ಯಮುನಾ ಗಂಗ ಉತ್ತರ ಜಲ ಸಿತರಂಗ ತಬ ಶುಭ ತಬ ಶುಭ ಶಿಶಿಷಮಾಗೆ ಗಾಯ ತಬ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಬರ್ತ್ಡೇ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ಆಗಿ ಆಗಿ ಬರೋದು